Hey everybody. Uh, this is just another intro to the video you're about to watch. This is another one that I felt needed a little bit of an introduction. We're going to be looking at my angelfish tank and we're going to be discussing dissolved CO2 uh, in the tank again. Now this video is a follow-up video to another one I shot and the first video just brought up so many questions and so many comments that I really struggled trying to get all of my thoughts into this video and I shot it many many times and was never satisfied with any of them I'm still not entirely satisfied with this one but it's the best I'm going to do for now again this is just another part of a continuing conversation so this is by no means going to be the last word on this uh, keep that in mind as you move forward and as always please enjoy Hi hey everybody. Uh, today I want to continue my conversation about dissolved CO2 in my planted aquariums. I shot a video a few days ago where I discussed why I do not use uh, CO2 injection in my tanks. And I'll attach a card to that video. You can go ahead and watch that. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about that video over again. But I got some um, debate going underneath of it as to whether or not CO2 really does collect in basements and low places in your house um, and I found that a little interesting and I have tried to, to shoot this video several times now and I keep getting hung up on explaining how CO2 accumulates in my basement and why I don't suffocate while I'm down here and that sort of thing and I've decided I'm not going to go that route I'm not going to do that video because I don't need to uh, all that information is readily available uh, if you've got the interwebs in front of you just google it you can find out all the information you want about how CO2 collects in basements and how it disperses and how it's heavier than air and sinks and so on and so forth all that stuff's readily available um, that wasn't the part of the video that I thought was going to spur the discussion because that's you know that's all just fact that just that happens that's that's not anything that there's any room to have any discussion about I was a little curious as to why that discussion continued so long um, what I do want to talk about is the fact that I have elevated levels of CO2 here in the basement and I also believe that contributes to the elevated levels of CO2 in my tanks now I've done a little bit of research over the last few days and a non-augmented or a non-injected tank should have about two to three parts per million CO2 in it. That's based on a 300 part per million normal natural atmospheric background levels. If you go outside, that's roughly the CO2 levels you will find. Um, our atmosphere is comprised of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen and the remaining 1% is all the other gases including carbon dioxide. Um, I want to make it very clear I'm not talking about carbon monoxide, CO, that is a very different gas, it has a very different impact on you if you were sitting in a basement with high concentrations of that, that is not what I'm talking about, that is a very dangerous situation, um, etc. That's something completely different. We're talking about carbon dioxide that you exhale uh, and then that your plants intake. So my basement has, oh, five times at least the normal background levels of CO2. I'm sitting usually right around 15 to 1,800 parts per million down here when I've got the windows all closed up and it's this time of year. In the summertime when the windows are open and there's more breeze moving through, the levels come down to about six to 800 parts per million down here in the basement. So I still do have higher than normal levels. So... I also have in my tanks, the one we're looking at is 14 parts per million dissolved CO2. My Garami tank had 13 parts per million dissolved CO2, and I haven't actually checked any of the other tanks down here yet. But I got to thinking this morning as I was shooting another one of these videos that never made the cut, if that's the case, then my tanks upstairs, you know, if, if the, the elevated levels of CO2 in the atmosphere down here are why I have such high levels of CO2 in my tanks, it would stand to reason that my tank upstairs that is not in my basement would have much lower levels of CO2 in it. So I have three tanks upstairs. Uh, one is very, very sparsely populated. It's a 10-gallon tank with a dwarf garami and a couple quarries and like two neons or three neons in it or something. The other one is a fairly heavily stocked tank, and then the other one has no fish at all in it, but it does have some plants in it. it I just haven't bothered to put any fish in it yet. I've let it cycle, and it's just sitting up there ready to go. So the heavily planted, or the heavily stocked tank, actually has a carbonate hardness of about 2.5, and, and it has a pH of neutral. 
So on the chart, and there's a chart that I'm going to attach to the description below, if you actually check your carbonate hardness and your pH and you have those two numbers, you can then find out how much dissolved CO2 you have. So the heavily stocked tank had levels that were actually off the bottom of the chart. So that was under 7 parts per million and based on guesstimating I'm going to say it was between 4 and 6, we'll call it 5 parts per million dissolved CO2 which also makes sense. It's in an enclosed room when my wife is in there, it's in my wife's uh, dressing room so she's in there in the morning for a while, she really elevates those levels of CO2 by breathing in there and then she leaves and closes the door behind her. Now that CO2 does dissipate and it does get out of that room. It's not sealed in there. That room's not hermetically sealed. But it takes time. It, it you know, it, in a closed room, the CO2 levels will build up if you're in there breathing. Um, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail about how I knew all this. I've already went into a little bit of detail in the other video. I have actually personally tested all these uh, numbers in my own house with very sensitive and very expensive electronic testing equipment. I'm not speculating on any of this stuff. I know how all this stuff works and I know what the parts per million levels are in various places of my house. So my upstairs being an enclosed house, I am inside, so our breath and the animal's breath and the uh, stove, you know, the, the, any fires, candles we have burning, all this stuff's generating CO2 in the house. So the upstairs does have higher than outside levels of CO2, but it doesn't have the same amount of CO2 you've got down here. So it stood to reason that I still had slightly higher than normal, you know, I had about five parts per million in the tank upstairs, not two or three. So that still works. There's slightly higher CO2 up there and there's slightly elevated CO2 in the tank. I have very elevated CO2 down here and there's very elevated CO2 in the tank. Now I don't have the know-how to do all the math to find out if those numbers are absolutely proportionately correct and so on and so forth. None of my science is real science. This is just me tinkering and speculating. But so far uh, everything has turned out exactly as I was expecting it to. So in the other video I shot, I raised the question. I wasn't quite sure how a CO2 diffuser put CO2 into the air. I know that with an air stone, it is not the bubbles themselves that are actually causing a lot of the gas exchange. It's the bubbles rising and pulling water along with it to the surface. And it's the surface area where you get your gas exchange and then that water flows back into your tank and you keep a nice balanced equilibrium. Um, if you have, like in my case, if you're in an environment that's a very CO2 enriched environment, it's still going to be through the surface area where that gas exchange happens. So I was curious as to whether or not uh, the CO2 rising through the water was less significant than it was once the bubbles burst on the surface with CO2 being heavier than air. Would the CO2 then flow across the surface of the tank and sit on the surface of the water? And uh, cause that little microclimate of a high concentration of CO2 to dissolve into the water. Now it's an interesting theory but I don't really think that's how it works. I've learned something about how diffusers work since I shot that video and again my speculation was based on no knowledge whatsoever so now that I have a little bit I do understand that the diffuser um, is designed to keep that gas in contact with water for as long as possible and that's where your gas exchange happens because in that case you really are just dissolving CO2 into the water it's such a high concentration of CO2 gas versus the dissolved CO2 in the water it's going to cause CO2 to dissolve into that water um, so once it bursts on the surface of your tank and flows away, that's pretty much it for the CO2. It's done its thing in the diffuser. The bubbles rising through the water, again, will contribute a little bit of CO2 to the water, but it's really what's going on in the diffuser is where all the magic happens. Um, I'm still curious, and I still do want to try one little simple experiment that I'm going to do, and I'm going to see how that turns out. I've already established that my tanks upstairs uh, have little or no carbonate hardness and therefore very little uh, CO2 dissolved into the water because I have lower atmospheric CO2 levels upstairs. Now I also have higher atmospheric CO2 levels down here and therefore have higher CO2 levels dissolved into my tanks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my quarantine tank that currently does not have any fish at all in it, uh, which works for my purposes. I don't want the fish in there 
uh, generating CO2. I want to find out about the gas exchange process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a simple CO2 generator. That's nothing more complicated than a milk jug or any kind of you know soda bottle, whatever, uh, with some sugar water in it and a little pinch of yeast. And that's pretty much all you need. Within an hour or two, you'll start to see the first bubbles rising, and it will look like a fizzy drink. And all those bubbles rising are CO2. As the yeast eats the sugar, its waste product is alcohol and CO2. So basically, it's a CO2 generator that is also making uh, very simple, basic sugar alcohol. Uh, so it's important if you do make one of these CO2 generators not to ever let any of that water come in contact with your fish water or your fish tanks or anything like that. Um, it is much more than just sugar water and the alcohol in there will, you know, obviously have an impact on your animals. So be very careful if you do uh, do any experiments with one of these little CO2 generators. You are making very weak beer, essentially, uh, when you do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one of those generators and I'm going to run the... Um, airline from the generator to the under the hood in the tank. I'm not going to put it down in the water. There's not going to be any bubbling occurring. Uh, or if I do, I will put it a quarter inch under the water surface so that it's visibly bubbling and when I shoot video of it people will be able to see that indeed I am generating a little bit of CO2 into the tank. But what I'm hoping is going to happen is that CO2 is going to pool and collect between the hood and the water surface and that higher microclimate of CO2 will that impact my water? Will that dissolve more CO2 into my water? I honestly don't think it is because one of the questions and one of the points that was raised in the debate under the other video was that I did not take into account uh, for convection currents. Um, CO2 being heavier than air and sinking and all that's well and good, but you got to really, again, do the research before, you know, you, you jump on me about it. Um, but it does sink very slowly, and it's very, very small air currents will disturb it and move it around and that sort of thing. I have very high levels just here in the basement. I'm not talking about the microclimate between the surface of the water and the top of the inside of my aquarium hood. I'm sure the amount of heat that's being generated from my light will cause enough um, convection currents to move around that it'll just rise that CO2 right up and out of the tank. So I really honestly don't expect anything to come of this experiment, but that in itself will tell me something. It will let me know that indeed it's not the surface area where the CO2 is getting in. And again, I'm talking about with the use of a diffuser. I'm not talking about my tanks where it's just the background atmospheric levels. So that's going to be my next little experiment. I'm going to see if I can um, do something with the CO2 levels in my tank just based on um, putting CO2 on the surface of the water as opposed to injecting it through a diffuser into the tank. So give me a couple of weeks to work on that. I got some fish in that tank right now that are in quarantine. So when they come out, I will then begin uh, working on that new CO2 experiment. So please give me your thoughts down below. Uh, I am going to put that chart in there uh, as well. So if you're curious about your own CO2 levels in your tank, there's some very simple uh, equations you can figure out. Just figure out your carbonate hardness, your pH, and then just cross-reference the chart, and that'll tell you how many parts per million dissolved solids, or I'm sorry, dissolved CO2, not dissolved solids, you have in your tank. So thanks for watching this video. If you're not already subscribed, please do so. I shoot a lot of videos like this. Uh, I'm very curious about a lot of things and how they work, and I just tinker with stuff to figure it out. So if you're subscribed, you won't miss any of these. And if you're already subscribed, thanks for being a subscriber. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you on the next one.